So I have a quick disclosure to mention here that I have an ongoing collaboration with Illumina where we have developed a TrueSeq cardio sequencing kit uh, and that is um, something that which we are, I will present a little bit on today. So first of all, just a little bit of um, information for you. You may have noticed in the um, uh, program this afternoon that I am from Singapore, China. Um, that is not the case. They did actually put Singapore, Singapore on, on the form, but somebody obviously changed that to Singapore, China. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, this is China, and this down here is Singapore. So Singapore is not in China, it just in case me. you were wondering. <laughs> So I'm talking about the um, genetics of cardiac diseases today, um, and cardiac diseases uh, come in two flavors, as do most genetic diseases, Mendelian and complex traits. Most of the cardiac diseases that we, d we deal with in the clinic and clinical cardiology are complex traits, such as coronary artery disease. This is far too complex to discuss here today, and interpreting the variants involved in those complex traits is extremely tricky um, and questionable, I would say. So I'm just going to focus here today on inherited cardiac conditions, which are Mendelian traits. So to introduce this, just a, a couple of pictures here of some people you may or may not know. So here we have uh, Reggie Lewis, who used to play for the Boston Celtics. Here's Fabrice Mwamba, who plays for Bolton Wanderers, one of the UK um, teams, not very good actually. And here's James Taylor, who's an English uh, cricketer. And what do these people have in common? Well, the thing that they all have in common is they have inherited cardiac conditions, which are Mendelian diseases, which affect the heart and the circulation. So Reggie Lewis unfortunately died while playing on a practice basketball court many years ago from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a big thick heart, the blood can't get out, and the heart goes into abnormal rhythms. Fabrice Mwamba, he collapsed on the football pitch and had 78 minutes of CPR. Uh, he survived that, and his brain is normal, and he has an, an inherited um, arrhythmic syndrome. And more recently, uh, James, uh, James Taylor, an English cricketer, uh, was uh, practicing. He had some abnormal uh, palpitations, and he turned out to have something called ARVC, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, where the right ventricle of the heart gets infiltrated and replaced with fat, and it causes sudden death. So these are examples of what I'm going to talk about today, which are inherited cardiac conditions, Mendelian diseases that run in families. <clears throat> so... How common are these? Well, inherited cardiac conditions of the heart and circulation cause sudden death in young people and affect up to one in 100 individuals collectively, not individually, but collectively. So they're not that uncommon. They are actually quite common. And they are the commonest cause of sudden death in young individuals uh, and in athletes. This is a list of those inherited cardiac conditions for you. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just to highlight a few uh, prominent disorders. This is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the top. HCM is what we call it. It has a prevalence, population prevalence of about one in 500, maybe higher. Uh, this is familial hypercholesterolemia, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Again, one in 500, perhaps one in 200. Uh, this is long QT syndrome, which causes the heart to go into funny rhythms, about 1 in 5,000. And this is dilated cardiomyopathy, or DCM, and I will be talking about this more, which has a prevalence of about 1 in 500. The list goes on with, with uh, uh, diseases affecting the aorta, the heart, uh, um, and the connective tissues. Um, and if you add that together, again, the prevalence of about 1 in 100 in the general population. <clears throat> so... Just some, some learning points and points just, just to, to make clear that inherited cardi cardiac conditions are multigenic, multi allelic disorders. And I, I, I separate those things out. I know they kind of say the same thing, but it's affecting multiple genes. And within each gene, there are multiple alleles. So this is complex, genetically complex at more than one level. They're most often autosomal dominant, not exclusively, but most often autosomal dominant. Loss of function and dominant negative poison peptide mechanisms um, occur in these conditions, and that's important for variant interpretation, and that's something I'm going to discuss in more detail later on. And they have very variable penetrance and expressivity, so having the, uh, the variant doesn't mean you're going to get the disease, and having the variant getting the disease doesn't mean the disease is going to be bad. So these are the things that we have to deal with when we're looking at inherited cardiac conditions and variant interpretation in these uh, syndromes. It's extremely difficult. So I deal a lot with cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons, and they're a difficult breed of people to talk to, and they often say to me, why bother do, do a, a genetic test at all in a cardiac condition? So just a list for you here, the reasons for doing this in our patients. So we can do it to make the diagnosis. We can use it for confirmatory uh, 
testing to confirm a condition such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We can also use it for predictive testing in family members. We can also use it, and I put this in brackets here, for prevention. Uh, I think this is something to earmark for the future. We're certainly not there now, uh, but we do now have gene-positive individuals at a young age and potential therapeutic interventions we, that we can use. Of course, prevention does work. We know, for instance, for instance, in FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, if we identify those people with the mutation, we can give them a statin early. We can also use it for prognosis. Not all mutations are the same, and some mutations can be more malignant and run more malignant courses than other ones. And we can also use stratified treatment to tailor therapy to the genetic defect and not just to the phenotype. And this is established for familial hypercholesterolemia, which I'm going to show you now. It isn't established for other ICCs, such as, uh, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, but I think this is something that is going to come for the future. So this is the example I just wanted to show you, very well established, about tailoring the therapy to the genetic, the medical therapy, uh, uh, management and investigation to the genetic defect, not just the phenotype. So I'm showing you here now is two individuals who have high cholesterol. This one here is rather slim. This one over here is rather porky. So they, they're similar um, cholesterol levels, slightly different body morphologies, but which is the one who's at risk of dying? Well, this one that I'm showing you now, as you look at it on the left, has a gene defect in the LDL receptor, whereas this one on the right likes burgers and eats a lot of them. Um, now, why it's important to know that they, although they have the same cholesterol levels, that the one on the left has a gene defect, is throughout his life, this person has had his arterial tree filling up with cholesterol in his carotids, his coronary arteries, and his peripheral vasculature, and he is full of cholesterol. He may have supravalvular stenosis whereas this one on the right has only been eating lots of burgers for a very short time. So actually, although the cholesterols are the same, it's the thinner person with a genetic defect who is at risk, who needs intensive investigation, intensive management, and family screening. So that's why it's important not just to look at the phenotype, but to look at the underlying genetic defect. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, briefly is um, three main areas testing for gene defects in inherited cardiac conditions, an example of the multi-gene sequence capture assay, which I'm going to discuss. I'm also going to talk about disease gene and variant-specific interpretation in HCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about what Heidi's going to talk about later, about getting with the guidelines and a tool that might help you. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, because you're going to hear about it in beautiful detail, I'm sure, from Heidi. Uh, but I'm just going to give a little bit of a touch uh, into this, uh, the guideline tools. So first things first. Uh, multi-gene uh, panel um, sequencing. So if you wish to look up this, uh, the um, publication behind what I'm about to talk about, this was published uh, in, uh, in February this year, uh, and here's the publication if you wish to look that up. <clears throat> so what this describes is a 174 gene capture assay. Many people have their own gene capture assays, but this is one that we've developed in, in our research laboratory over about the last five or six years. And then we have worked with Illumina to generate this into, a, into a, um, an assay that can be bought off the shelf and works extremely well reproducibly, and you can just buy the lot and, and get the same performance each time. To be clear, it has clinical genes what I term clinical genes. Those are genes which we know how to interpret if it was in a clinical setting. Well, this is a research use only kit, just to be clear on that. And we also have research genes. So these are genes that we think might be important for the disorder, but we're not entirely sure, and we want to work them up in cases and controls. And so the assay comprises of both of these components. And it covers all inherited cardiac conditions that you might be interested in, uh, in the single assay. Obviously, when you run the assay and you want to look at a particular condition, you'll need to zoom in on the genes of interest and ignore the rest, which fill your databases for controls. So this is now, I'm just zooming in on the clinically interpretable genes, and you can see here, well, you can't see, but you, imagine, um, that we have the conditions listed down here, and in each condition, we have the genes that we believe are clinically important for that condition. So just to make that a little bit more visible, for something like dilated cardiomyopathy, we might list these genes here as genes that we believe from the published literature based on um, uh, prevalence within cases or segregation data in families or functional data or all of the above are important for the disease. So if we were to look, look at these genes clinically, we need to sequence all of them, but we also for DCM sequence another 40 genes which we think might be important. <clears throat> I'm going to quickly run through the performance of, 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 of the panel just so you get an idea. 
So first of all, um, if we concentrate on this method four here, which is using the panel on the next seat 500, um, this has a mean coverage of the target at 99.9% um, at uh, 20x. So every single gene in the assay, those 174 genes, are covered at 99.9%, and the range is from 99.9 to 99.9. .9. Compare that to off-the-shelf whole exome sequencing, we have 88, and compare it to whole genome sequencing, we have 99.3. If we then look at the coverage uh, of the target, on average with the panel using the NexSeq 500, we're running 48 samples at once, we have about 550-fold coverage, compared to 74-fold coverage with whole exome sequencing and about 70-fold coverage with whole genome sequencing. And then if you look at the price, running the panel, uh, it costs about 200 US dollars, compiled to whole, whole exome sequence about 900, and whole genome sequence at this time was 2,800. So the panel works extremely well. It works as well as whole genome sequence, if not better, and whole exome sequencing off the shelf, I would argue, is not particularly good in a setting where you want to interrogate the whole of the gene. This is a visual representation of that. Green is good, red is bad. Uh, green represent a, a represents 100% coverage of the gene on average, and the bottom of the scale here is 98%, which is still not bad. But if you look at whole exome sequencing, these are all the genes which are important clinically for inherited cardiac conditions. The whole exome sequencing does very, very poorly compared to the assay run on the next seek. There's one gene here, TGF beta receptor 1, which is very difficult to capture in, a, in one exon, which is failed by all te techniques, including actually a non capture assay in whole, in, in, in whole genome sequencing. What about accuracy? We know accuracy is important, and how do we assess it? Well, we can use the platinum genomes, genome in a bottle, and this is what we've done on a few runs. And this is just to give an example of that on the MySeq. So we have a, a true positive rate of 245. We sequence about 500,000 true negatives. We have a sensitivity of 100% and a precision of 100%. We do miss one uh, indel with a false negative, and that was an A in a run of A's in a non-coding part or, or just outside of an exon. So this gives you a, an idea of the sensitivity and precision that we have with running this assay. <clears throat> so just to finish on this part of the talk, so testing for gene defects in inherited cardiac conditions, the learning points I'd like to put to you are that inherited cardiac conditions are multigenic and multi-allelic diseases. Panels of genes need to be sequenced in these conditions. So you can't just sequence one gene. You have to sequence, for instance, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, at least four, probably nine. And in dilated cardiomyopathy, you need to sequence at least five, probably eight. Um, Off-the-shelf whole exome sequence does not perform well if you run it according to the standard guidelines. Even if you go very, very deep, it still struggles with GC-rich regions and other complex regions of, of target. So we would not recommend this unless it was done on a, on a low-throughput research basis. 100% precision is possible with some assays, uh, and I think we've shown that repeatedly with what we've looked at with the genome in the bottle. Uh, depth of coverage is important. I might ask you as the audience, how deep is enough? Uh, how deep do you need to go to be confident? Uh, and maybe we can talk about that later. <clears throat> so next, I wanted to move on to disease genome variance specific uh, interpretation in HCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is a first flash of the, of the guidelines from ACMG, uh, and this is going to come in a lot more detail later, and I'm going to skim over it. But basically, the, what we want to try to do at the, in our variant interpretation is get to the, what you can see on the left-hand side there, that we assign a pathogenicity to a variant as pathogenic, likely pathogenic, greater than 90 or 95 percent chance of being pathogenic, a VUS, variant of unknown significance, likely benign, 90 or 95 percent chance of being benign, or benign. And this, again, from the guidelines, which we'll go through in a lot more detail, are uh, the levels of evidence that you might use from population data, computational prediction, functional data, segregation data, de novo data, allelic data. And this can help you assign uh, uh, a score for uh, being benign or ass assign a score for being more pathogenic. So this is the data that we have. But if we just take a step back with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy, I think we can ask a more fundamental question. So is it a disease gene at all? Uh, and I think we have this as a problem um, within the data sets that we have based on some of the literature that has been published. <clears throat> and this is uh, an example why, and this was being uh, produced by Roddy Walsh, who's doing a PhD with me. Um, and he's looked at the publications uh, 
showing uh, the gene has been associated with a disease over the years. This is 2014 at this end, 1989 down this end. And you can see year on year we have an increase in the number of genes which are associated with DCM. We're now above 60. Uh, and here we are with HCM, we're almost up to 60 on this. And this is also true for ARVC, Long QT, and Brugada syndrome. So as we're able to sequence more and more, we assign more and more genes as being associated with disease. We have uh, recently compiled data from over 6,000 hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients uh, and looked at these in detail at sarcomeric genes. These are the genes that we know are important for the disease. And we find myosin binding protein C mutations about 17%, MYH7 mutations about 10%, troponin I and troponin T mutations as expected. But there's also a lot here where we find no pathogenic variant in about 70% of cases. So the question is, could it be that these new genes are filling in this space? And it's the fact we just need to sequence more genes to get more detail and find more genotype positive individuals. <clears throat> this is a complex slide, but the summary is, of the slide is no, that is not the answer. Um, if you look over on this side here, what we're showing is the case frequency of rare variants in the genes compared to the frequency observed in the exact consortium of 60,000 individuals. So what you would expect is that the rare variants which are disease-causing are enriched, i.e. to this side of the line, in cases, as we see for the known uh, HCM genes. If you now expand that analysis over on this side to new potential HCM genes, you can see a lot of these genes are falling actually on the line of equivalence, so they're equally rare variants in these genes are equally common in cases and controls, or actually that the rare variants are more common in controls than they are in the cases. And that is for a lot of genes, uh, uh, the majority of the genes which have recently been published as disease causing an HCM. So in the absence of segregation data, faced with a single variant in an individual, you simply cannot interpret it based on the evidence that we currently have. So a lot of the recent HCM disease genes are, not, are likely not HCM disease genes at all. And if you have segregation data, then you have a chance. But if you don't, you really can't interpret those variants that you are faced with. So I want to just, just to expand on that a little bit about the danger of expanded panels. So panels are good, and we, we know they're, they are essential for looking at multi-allelic, multigenic disease. However, you can end up sequencing things and interpreting variants as being pathogenic when they are probably not. So I apologize to whoever's posted this was here at the, at the conference, but this is not in isolation. And this is just showing HCM patients who were, who were sequenced, about 58 of them. And this table now gives the distribution to describe pathogenic mutants by gene. Majority of these genes here, apart from myosin binding protein C uh, and myosin heavy chain, are not HCM genes, but they're being reported in a table as pathogenic. And this, is, again, is not in isolation. We see this all the time. So this is something I think we have as a, a community need to be very careful about, is things being labeled pathogenic in genes which are weakly associated with disease. And if they have a rare variant, they're being called a pathogenic variant. So I think it's a, it's a warning to us, to us all. So I want to just move on a little bit and talk about variant class, and particularly focusing on missense mutations and nonsense. And I'd like to flash, I was going to show you this database, but unfortunately I, don't, I wasn't allowed to use my Mac, so I'm using a PC of which I'm awful with. So I'm just showing you the database, the, the web address there. And if anyone wants want to look at that, you can dig into the, what, the data behind what I'm going to show you now. So if you go to this uh, website, this is the website interface, and this is uh, held at our laboratory at Imperial College at Royal Brompton Hospital in London. And it enables you to look at a number of tools to en help you uh, interpret variants. So uh, one of these uh, tools here is the ACGV, which is the data behind uh, a publication which is currently in press at uh, Genetics and Medicine, where we performed reassessment of Mendelian gene pathogenicity in 7,855 cardiomyopathy patients and 60,000 60, reference samples from the exact. Uh, it, this is also in bioarchive if you want to access that directly. <clears throat> Just one note before I dive into this about uh, the etiological fraction, or EF. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but basically what we use this as is a way of um, interpreting whether a variant in an individual in, in front of you is likely causative of the, of the disease that they have. You can read uh, the definitions there that are, are, are used for the etiological fraction, which is calculated from the odds ratio. But in short, the EF represents 
um, the confidence in interpreting variation as etiological significant when found in an individual with the disease. So an EF of 1 would mean that that variant was causative in, in the individual. You'll never have an EF of 1. But an EF of 0.5 would be a 50-50 uh, chance, a 50% chance that it's, that it's causative, a 50% chance that it's not. So now, uh, just zooming into this web page here, so now we're looking at myosin binding protein uh, C, and we have sequenced uh, this in 6,200 uh, 6, individuals, and then we can look at whether or not they are enriched, and they are. Compared to controls, they are present 17% higher. This is highly significant. But if you look at the odds ratios and the etiological fractions, this is for all variants here, the odds ratio is 11. But if you look at truncating variants, the odds ratio is 120. That's very, very different. And that compares to a non-truncating variant, which has an odds ratio of 5.7. So just by looking at truncating versus missense, you have a very different odds ratio and a very different interpretation of that variant in that individual. This is now looking at myosin binding protein C in dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is listed in all of the tests that you go to as a DCM gene. You'll probably notice here that having sequenced this in 1,200 DCM cases, it is actually not statistically significantly increased in rare variants less than 0 0.0001 in DCM cases versus the exact. That, accounts, that applies to all variants truncating variants and, and, and non-truncating variants. So the question to you is, are rare variants in my, myosin binding protein C a cause of DCM? Well, it is in all the tests that we run in all of our, in, in all of our institutions, but the data that now looking at the very data from the exact might begin to question that. What about myosin uh, MYH7? So here we're looking at in, in another 6,000 HCM cases, and here we can see that truncate, it, it, it is associated with HCM, but truncating variants aren't, they have an odds ratio of 1.7, whereas non-truncating missent variants have an odds ratio of 12. So again, variant class now tells us uh, a lot about the odds ratio, and this then relates to the disease mechanism, whether it being haploinsufficiency or a poison peptide dominant negative mechanism. Uh, and what about in DCM? Uh, again, we find it's increased in DCM, but once again, we find that truncating variants have an odds ratio of 1.5 and are not significant, whereas the missense variants have an odds ratio of 4 and are significant. So once again, truncation versus missense tells you whether or not a, a variant is pathogenic in that gene, in that disease. Something else just to be aware of is location does matter. So what we're showing here are in gray are variants in DCM cases and HCM cases versus rare variants in the exact uh, cohort. And you can see in HCM there is a cluster here which is significantly enriched for HCM variants. Uh, and this is a hot spot within the gene, within the myosin head, uh, and that affects the etiological fraction, which goes up from 0.75 to 4 up to almost 1 during that, in that region. So by lo looking at location, that can give you more information about the effect of the variant and the likelihood is that it's actually causing the disease. Uh, I have no idea what time it is. This thing's not, how long am I doing? It's still 20 minutes. Still 20 minutes, great, okay, sorry. Um, so what about interpreting titan variants in, in dilated cardiomyopathy? And I want to talk to you about this a little bit because this is something we've researched quite heavily over the last few years. So nonsense truncating mutations of titan cause dilated cardiomyopathy, are associated with cardi dilated cardiomyopathy, in about 20% of cases. Uh, in more severe cases, they have more truncations. In less severe cases, ambulant cases, they have fewer mutations. Rare missense variants in Titan are very, very common. We all have them, uh, but currently they're not interpretable. We're working on this. We believe there are domain-specific effects, and we can actually begin to tease out what parts of Titan may have an effect with, with missense, but currently we, we feel that we are not able to interpret missense variants in Titan in general. So what I want to talk about today is the location of the variant and something called the percentage spliced in. Uh, which is a measure of the usage of an exon within a gene within a specific tissue. And again, if you want to look at this, this is on CardioDB under the Titan tool. <clears throat> so the location of the truncating variant in Titan is important. It's a huge molecule. It's 30,000 amino acids long, 100,000 ba uh, base pairs long for cDNA. The locus is 300,000 base pairs itself. So this is the Z disk of the Titan molecule, the I band, the springy bit, the A band, and the M-band. 
Um, and what we have done, and this is a complex table, so I will just zoom into part of it. What we've done is we've analyzed in uh, about 2,000 DCM cases compared to 60,000 controls, the odds ratio, the etiological fraction, the p-value for each domain. Uh, and the domain, uh, so if we look, if we zoom in on that, you can see the odds ratio for a variant in the A-band is about 20. In the I-band, depending where you are in the I-band, it's variable. For non-cardiac um, um, exons, so whether PSI, percentage splicing, is less than 20, that the odds ratio is negligible, i.e. They, they don't cause disease. And if it's in the M-band or the Z-disc, odds ratio is down about four. So, it, so the effect of a truncating variant within this molecule, which we believe haploinsufficiency is the underlying mechanism, so why this variability is there is difficult to explain, but there is definitely a variability in the effect of a truncation throughout the entirety of that molecule. So this is just to zoom in on PSI and explain it a little bit more to you if you're not familiar with it. So this is, again, a, a schematic of the Titan molecule with the Z-disc, the I-band, the A-band, and the M-band. And this, now in gray, on this panel here, is showing you the PSI, percentage spliced in. So if an exon is always included in all the transcripts, it will have a PSI of 1 or 100 percent because it's always there. So the A-band exons in Titan in the heart are always included. So if you have a truncating variant in this part of the molecule, it will affect all transcripts and the, uh, the ribosomes will fall off and you will be haploinsufficient for the molecule. However, if you dig here into the I-band, this is using RNA-seq data from about uh, 120 uh, human uh, heart explants. So here in the I-band, a lot of the exons are very heavily spliced. So a lot of them are spliced out, and a lot of them are symmetrical and be spliced out and skipped over. So if you have a truncating variant in this part of the molecule where the PSI is very low because the exons aren't included, actually you won't get the disease. So just looking at the DNA variation is not enough. You need to know where in the molecule it is, and you need to know the expression level of that exon in that tissue. And this is, this is from the Science Translational Medicine paper, which actually shows that. So what we have here is looking at the variants in healthy volunteers, population cohorts, unselected DCM patients, and end-stage DCM patients. Now, all of these groups do have truncating variants. We sequenced about 3,000 controls here. But you can see the PSI is very variable in, in the controls and the population because they often fall into, into very low PSI exons and they don't cause disease. Whereas in the cases, they fall into very high PSI exons and this was also true in a replication cohort. So in the general population where we know there are titan truncations in about 1% of the population, so there's probably five people in this room who've got a titan truncation. Um, but those individuals will most likely have that truncation falling into a non-cardiac transcript, such as Novex 3, or into an exon which is not constitutively incorporated into all transcripts. So it becomes extremely important in your interpretation of that variant. <clears throat> so this is, I'm going to just, as I can't go to the website, I'm going to zoom in now to show you a few pages from, from the database, which is available for you all to use, to just uh, color that a little bit. So if you go into the, into the, into the web page, it takes you to the Titan variants in dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, what we do on this page is we go into some great detail about annotating different transcripts. So we created a meta transcript, which has an LRG, which has concatenated all of the other transcripts together, which we use for variant interpretation. Titan itself has two uh, main transcripts, the N2B and the N2A. Um, and it also has a number of non-cardiac transcripts, such as Novex 3, which doesn't span the cardiac sarcomere. But these are all listed for you here with hyperlinks. <clears throat> so if you then scroll down the page, you can see how we describe this. So we give the, the uh, exon number based on the metatranscript. We also give you the exon number for each of the other transcripts, because these don't uh, track the metatranscript. We also give you the PSI the percentage spliced in. So for instance, in this uh, exon here, exon 11 of the metatranscript, the PSI is 50. So a variant in that exon is less likely to cause disease as compared to an, an, uh, a variant in the exon above it or the exon further downstream. And we also tell you whether it's symmetric or not, because sym symmetric exons, if they have a variant in it, can be spliced out and skipped and remain in frame and therefore can be uh, less uh, likely to be pathogenic. So we can scroll down here to one of my favorite exons, uh, exon 305, um, which is about 3,000 uh, uh, base, uh, base pairs long. 
And if you zoom into that exon there, we can let, we will then tell you all about that exon. We'll tell you its, it's PSI is 100% as we've calculated it. And then we also uh, raid the GTEx data as well. So it's 97% from the GTEx data from the Broad. Um, and then we also show you all the variants that have been collated so far that have been shown to occur in this exon truncating variants. And you'll see here from the New England Journal paper 2012, there's four individuals with DCM from different populations. In the science translational medicine, we have uh, two different DCM populations with, with variants in it. But you'll also see from the Framingham Heart Study a control individual who also has a, has a stop. Uh, in this exon. So it's highly enriched for disease variants, but you can get population controls who also have a variant, which adds complexity to Titan interpretation. So we don't have all the answers for Titan yet. And this is a track here showing all of the Titan truncations from the exact cohort, so 60,000 individuals. So there's about 400 in highly expressed exons in the general population, just below what, about 1%, just below 1%. So what are these doing? What are these doing in the general population? Why don't they cause disease? Uh, are, are they penetrant? Are we just missing a, a subtle low expressivity phenotype? Uh, and we have a paper on this currently uh, in review, and we can answer that for you. So some learning points on this. Not all HCM, DCM, and disease genes are disease genes, and I think we have to be very wary of this. Variant classes of, of central importance, and, it, and it's important because you need to understand the underlying disease mechanism. Is it haploinsufficiency? or is it a, um, a dominant negative poison peptide effect? Location is important for pathogenicity in all of these big genes, and I've just shown you two examples with myosin heavy chain and with titan. Uh, variants and express exons are important, and to do this, I've shown you in the heart, we have tissue-specific RNA sequencing to annotate the PSI of each exon, but if you work in other diseases, you need to know the PSI of your exons in your disease in your tissue of interest. Um, and disease variants in Titan and other genes are seen in the general population. And they are there and they should cause disease, but they may not. And this may be an, a, 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 something to do with expressivity rather than penetrance. We need to think about this carefully. So I'm going to finish up now, I hope I have five more minutes, just to talk a little bit about uh, Get With The Guidelines and a tool to help you. This is what you'll be hearing next. But I wanted to show you how we've applied this within our laboratory to dealing with inherited cardiac conditions. So we have uh, Nicola Whiffen, who's a, a postdoctoral bioinformatics person in my team, has created this tool called the ACMG Cardio Classifier. <clears throat> and what we've done here is we've taken these wonderful guidelines from ACMG and we've kind of customized them for the diseases that we're interested in, diseases, uh, inherited diseases of the heart. And one thing that's important that we've applied is disease-specific population threshold. I'll go through this quickly. It's a little bit complex. Bear with me. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy has a prevalence of about 1 in 500, which means about 1 in 1,000 alleles. <clears throat> we, in the, in the paper which is currently in Genetics and Medicine Press, have looked at the most common variant that we find in HCM. And we find this variant, this is the variant if you wish to know the details of the variant, we find it in 104 out of 6,000 HCM cases. Therefore, the most common variant in the most common gene is coming in at about 1.7% uh, of cases. Long story short, this would give us a population allele frequency of about 2 times 10 to the minus 5. Actually, this is what we see. So in exact, we find three of these variants. So we calculate it should be about two times n to the minus five that we see in the general population, and that's pretty much what we see. <clears throat> but then we can use this as a filter, because any variant with a, with a minor allele frequency of greater than that amount is going to be too common to cause, ACM, to cause HCM, because that variant is not going to be more common than the commonest variant in the commonest gene. So we can apply that filter then and say anything with a, with a uh, a math above that is most unlikely to be uh, uh, an HCM uh, gene, even taking into account penetrance effects. And we've applied this to all of our inherited cardiac conditions. So just to show you uh, grossly how this, uh, uh, this works then, so for our conditions, so if you go to HGMD Professional 2015.1 and you filter out all of those genes in HCMG, which have a frequency of greater than what we've applied, you cut out 250 disease genes for the, for the, the, the diseases we're interested in. And okay, there are some really spooky ones up here for ARVC with an exact frequency of 0.7, but a lot of them are down here about 1 in 100 or below, which are still far too high to be disease-causing genes. So immediately, 250 genes in ACMG can pretty much be thrown out as not disease-causing. I'll skip over that. So this is just the last two slides. So this is basically what we show. You can't see it very well. So we, you put in a VCF, 
and it spits out a result fully automated for you to look at and interpret. So in this case, it's, uh, it was an HCM patient, and it has classified this as pathogenic. It's a missense. It gives you the uh, protein position, the genomic position, gives you the coverage, and this run it was at 256 uh, depth coverage, and the allele balance was 0.43. And then we have the various uh, levels of evidence which are positive in this, in, in this individual for this variant have been colored in, which gave it the score which assigned its pathogenicity. We then show the exact data of 1,000 genomes, the ESP, our in-house volunteers, volunteers from China and Singapore, and then HCM cases both internally and externally. And actually, in our external database of 7,000 HCM cases, this variant has been seen 11 times in HCM cases. So not only do, are we assigning its pathogenicity on the, all this evidence, but we also have 11 previous reports of it being pathogenic in HCM cases. It's predicted as pathogenic by the vast majority of the algorithmic pr prediction tools. It falls in a hot spot within the gene for, for HCM, and we supply hyperlinks then to the references that have previously reported that uh, variant as pathogenic. So this is what spits out automatically at the end for you then as the researcher or potentially one day in the future the clinician to be able to interpret that variant. And this is another uh, variant just to end with for DCM. So this has been assigned a likely pathogenic, so a 90, we believe a 90% chance this is pathogenic. It's in MY87. This is its uh, coding position, protein position, genomic position. It's heterozygous. It was called by uh, haplotype, called a unified haplotype, and it was, had a 900-fold coverage, allele balance of 0.44. Here's the evidence that assigned it this likely pathogenic score. Very strong here would be predicted that the loss of function was the mechanism of disease. I think we will be able to add this in for Titan quite soon, and we have a paper in review showing this. This has actually been seen in one case in the exact cohort uh, in, in Finnish Europeans. We have seen it in one case, DCM case previously. It's predicted by all of the tools that we look at, apart from this one, to be uh, um, damaging. And it, once again, it falls in a hot spot of the gene predicted to cause disease. And then we also provide the references for the clinician or the researcher to dig into to go and validate that in more detail. So I will stop there. I would like to thank very many people, but prominently here, Roddy Walsh, who's doing a PhD with me at the Royal Brompton Hospital in Imperial College, and Nicola Whiffen, who's a, who's a uh, postdoctoral bioinformatician in my group. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This um, presentation is open for discussion. If you have a question, please move to one of the mics. Maybe I, I, it's all, it's all hello, <laughs> my name is Isabelle Twitou from Montpellier, France. I have a question. Have you seen any evidence of diagenism, for example, in uh, addition of variants with low effect in the same uh, pathophysiological uh, pathway? Sorry, could you say that again? Oh, okay. I'm <laughs> sorry about my very French accent. <laughs> okay, I was asking about possible diagenism, oligogenism. That is the addition of many variants of, with a very low effects in the same pathophysiological pathway. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so this um, has been looked at for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and also for some other conditions, um, and there is evidence for it, um, and we also have evidence for it in dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's, it's quite difficult to tease out the information from the variants, but we believe there is a signature for it, but it's not common. They may have a higher frequency in yeah. the general population. Yeah, it's possible, yeah. But we don't have the evidence. That's a problem. Yeah. Uh, Mickey Siegel from Simul Consult. In the, the channelopathy world, we, we worry that a lot of the quoted frequencies, uh, uh, incidences of the diseases are, are huge underestimates. Yeah. And so are you incorporating anything that tries to give a sense of how much people believe the, uh, the quoted incidence levels? Yeah, so, we, uh, so I, I think you make an important point. I think that's true not just for the channelopathies. Uh, I think it's generically true across, across inherited cardiac conditions. Um, so what we have done is we've used uh, a minor allele frequency in a condition that we believe is relatively common, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then applied that across the other conditions. So I would guess in the channelopathies, Brigadus syndrome, CPVT, non-QT, that they are not more common than HCM. And therefore, by using that as a conservative uh, cutoff, that we won't be over-stringent on our threshold. 
Thank you. Question to the right. Yeah. Uh, Sonia van Doren from Brussels. My question is whether your tool is also applicable to the research genes or only to the clinical genes in your panel? It, so it's, it's, a, it's applicable to all genes. Uh, but obviously, um, if it's not a known pathogenic gene, then the supporting evidence you're going to have to assign pathogenicity is going to be very low. But it, we, the data is still provided, but it won't be provided, as you would have seen there, for what was a pathogenic mutation. They'll be returned as a different class. So, and the outcome is always one variant. It's not like, even if it's diagenic or not, it's not like, like you get a ranking of variants with you, pathogenicity. You, you, so this currently, as it, as it falls now, you get a, a number of variants. They're not ranked. They're just returned as whether or not they're, which category that they fall into. And yes, you do get more than one. Thanks. I have another question uh, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you hinted upon coverage depth. So could you say something more about what is needed? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I don't have the answer to that. Uh, more is better. Um, I, I think, um, you know, the deeper you go, and also if you, with regard, to, there's been a few com conversations about Sanger sequencing. I think once you're getting to, you know, 200x coverage and you've got an allele balance which falls between 0.45 and 0.55, I mean, do you ever need to Sanger validate those variants? Uh, in our experience, nothing is ever not validated. So I think that presumably we'll get to a stage sometime we'll, say, we'll have a cutoff when we can actually confidently say we don't need to Sanger validate. I think it's also a question of more, perhaps some more interesting things that we might be missing. Uh, CNVs are very difficult to call. Obviously, the more deep you go, potentially the more power you have to call CNVs. Uh, and mosaicism is something else. Mm -hmm. We know it's out there, um, but we don't usually have enough depth to get at it. Mm -hmm. But if we're now sequencing things at 1,000x coverage routinely on our runs for $200, I think we might have a chance to begin to look mm -hmm. at that in more detail as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, last uh, question. Can I ask a really mm -hmm. brief follow-up question? Yeah, sure. Uh, in some uh, isolated populations, the frequency in that population is higher, and people will often use a frequency from a restricted population and another. So how do you handle all of those and make sure you're not yeah. freezing out, you know, a disease that's common in, in a subgroup? Yeah, so I think, you know, so founder mutations, if you've got a common founder mutation such as you have in the Netherlands for HCM, you need to know what those are because the, the MAF filter would cut those out. So we, we, we have to be wary of those and we don't have a way of... of, of of filtering, of, of, we have to know, be aware of those, and presumably we will be aware of those 